Thank you very much, Debbie. Let's pray together as we keep our Bibles open and ask God to help us understand. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that by your spirit you inspired Paul to write these words. And we pray that now you will help us that that same spirit may open our minds to understand your truth, may soften our hearts so that we receive it, and may empower our wills so that we may serve you as the body of Christ here on earth. For the glory of your name. Amen. You'll find uh, an outline of the uh, talk this morning on the back of the notice sheet, and you may like to have that as we go through this passage. Uh, Amidst all the coverage of the uh, Occupy London protest at St. Paul's this week, you may have come across uh, one article in the press which had as its heading, The Church Looks Like a Heritage Society on the Hop. Uh, The article went on to say what the church should look like in the thought of the writer. It looks like a heritage society on the hop, he said, rather than a moral force engaging with society. Well, this week has been um, full of uh, journalists and uh, media pundits telling us what the church should be like, uh, what it should look like, what it should be doing. But the question that we want to address this morning, and this passage will help us to do it, is not what should the church look like in terms of its image in society, but what should the church be? What is God's purpose for God's people? And that's very much Paul's agenda as we start now the second half of this wonderful letter to the Ephesians. And uh, we move from the very rich teaching which we've had in the first three chapters to its outworking in practical everyday living in the last three chapters. Now, of course, it's false to make a distinction between the two and say the first half's all about teaching and the second half's all about application because the application's woven into the teaching and during the application sections, we're reminded of what we've already learnt. They're intertwined with one another all the way through. But we do see here a focus on the practical side of that wonderful teaching about Christ and the church. Now, Paul, at the beginning of our section this morning, makes it clear that he has a purpose. He is urging his hearers, his readers, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, verse 1 says. He, He reminds them and us that He's writing this as a prisoner. Fulfilling his calling as the apostle to the Gentiles has cost him his liberty. And if they're going to be Christians who are effective in their community in Ephesus, in Asia Minor, in all those little churches around, then they too will have to fulfill their calling, whatever the cost may be. Because this is now the primary concern of their lives, to be Christian men and women, wherever God has placed them in their everyday context. And that's why I think he uses the word walk in verse 1, to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. A walk is, of course, a step-by-step progress in a definite direction to achieve a goal. Uh, It is possible to ramble around in circles, but most of us don't spend time doing that. We walk to places for purpose. And he's saying, now your Christian life needs to have that sort of direction. And he's going to spell out for us, and we'll be studying it in the next few weeks, the imperatives, the commands of the Christian lifestyle, which flow out of the fact that we belong to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, that he's made us members of that body we've been thinking about this morning. So the order's right. First, we need to understand the truth and then to apply it. The truth comes to our mind so that we can grasp it. And as we've just been praying, it will then soften our hearts so that we receive it at the control center of our personality in order that our wills may be empowered by God's spirit to put it into practice. And we know that we really believe the Bible when we start to do what it says. That's true when we first became Christians, wasn't it? We may have been impressed by the gospel. We may have seen its logic. We may have said, well, there's no argument that I can bring about against it. It seems to be true that Jesus really lived in history, that he really did do these amazing things and teach these wonderful words, that he was crucified. And yes, the evidence is very strong that he was raised from the dead. But you only really believe that when you repent, when you turn to Christ, 
when you trust him for yourself. And just as that's the way into the Christian life, so it's the way on in the Christian life, that we only really believe the Bible when it dictates the practice of our lives. And this verb, walk, binds these chapters together. So today's big theme is that we walk in unity, but if you just track through the coming up uh, passages for the next few weeks, you'll see in verse 17 of chapter one, uh, chapter four rather, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. So we've got to walk in holiness, not in our pre-conversion ways. Chapter five, verse two says, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Chapter five, verse eight, middle of the verse, walk as children of light. And again in chapter five, verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, walk in wisdom. Now, not surprisingly, Paul's first concern is for unity. The coming of Christ as the great rescuer of mankind through his death and resurrection means, as we've been taught in these opening chapters, that all those hostile forces of evil which disrupt and destroy human relationships and human communities have been dealt with in Jesus Christ. He has dealt them their death blow. If you want to put it another way, these opening chapters have taught us that there is a greater power, a greater power than the forces of evil. That is the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord that unites Jews and Gentiles in Christ, free men and slaves, men and women, in a new community of love under the headship of the Lord Jesus. Now this loving unity of those who might by nature, if not be enemies, at least not be getting on with one another. This new unity created by God through the gospel is the living proof of the truth of who Christ is and of how he can transform the world. Proof of the supremacy, the preeminence of Jesus. Proof of the ruling authority of Jesus. As the church becomes the pilot scheme, here in time, of what God will do with the whole of his renewed creation in eternity. Now that's why unity matters to God. The growth and development of the church depends on it. If the claims of the gospel are going to be seen to be authentic, then one of the ways in which that will be communicated to our culture is by the love and unity of the people of God. And as you'll see from the outline this morning, we have two aspects of this unity before us. What Paul calls the unity of the spirit, which comes up in verse 3. And this, he says, is a unity to be maintained. And then in verse 13, the unity of the faith, which is a unity to be attained. Just look at those verses with me for a moment. Verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And then in verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now we're going to use those two references to help us unpack the passage. And let me say that this passage really merits three or four Sunday morning sermons. It is so rich and so instructive and all we'll get is a bird's eye view. But take the bird's eye view with you into the week, read the passage over again, perhaps several days during the week, get into the depth of it. There's such richness here. And this morning perhaps we can just take the overview or put a key in our hands to unlock the door and uh, to really study it further at home during this week. Let's look then firstly at the unity of the spirit. The fact that it is to be maintained means obviously that this is a given unity. It is something that God has already created. And verse three indicates that it's given by the Holy Spirit. Now we know from the preceding uh, Uh, material back in chapter 2 that this unity is grounded in the work of the Lord Jesus for all of his people in his death on the cross. If you just turn back a page let's go back to chapter 2 verse 14 because this theme is so central to the whole letter. We read that Christ himself 214 is our peace. He has made us both one, that is Jews and Gentiles who are in Christ, are now a new community, a new man as he calls it in verse 15. He has created in himself one new man 
in place of the two, so making peace. So Paul wants to remind us that the Lord Jesus is the one who has made us one. He broke down the dividing wall of hostility. He created in himself the one new man, as Paul calls it, which is, of course, a metaphor for the church, the united body of all Christians everywhere. He reconciled us to God in that one body, his physical body, as it hung there dying in our place on the cross. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and our hearts to the reality of the love of Christ, which passes knowledge as we saw last week, but to bring us to experience that love more and more, to bring us to trust him more and more, and so to unite us to the life of the Trinity and therefore to one another. It's a bond of peace, Paul says in chapter 4, verse 3. And that peace comes through the blood of the cross, and it's peace with one another because we are all on the same ground before God. We're all redeemed people, if we're Christians trusting the Lord Jesus, who are in relationship with him on exactly the same foundation. We are one in Christ. Now, the nature of this unity is expanded by Paul in verses 4 to 6. Uh, he says uh, in seven different ways what this oneness looks like so that we see just how central it is to God's purposes. There's one body of which Christ is the head. So that the church universal, whether it is the church triumphant in heaven around the throne of God at rest from its labors, or the church militant here on earth fighting the good fight of the faith, the church is united in heaven and on earth as one body. And that is expressed in every local congregation like ours here. Each local church is a manifestation of the heavenly gathering around the throne of God and of the Lamb. And we are united in Christ, by Christ, as that one body. And the mark of that is that the one spirit is planted within every true member of the church when we are born again when we begin our Christian pilgrimage. Because what is the new birth? It is the life of God being planted in our personalities, the spirit indwelling us, energizing us, and uh, coordinating us as the new born people of God. So what he's saying is there's no way, other way into the church. The Bible recognizes the church is expressed both universally and locally. The Bible doesn't actually recognize the church being expressed denominationally. That's not a biblical category. And while denominations may be useful, we need to remember that they are also expendable. We're not members of a religious club. We are in an organic spiritual union with Christ. He dwells in our hearts through faith, and that is what unites us together with every Christian everywhere in the world who has had that experience of the new birth in Jesus. And that's the only sort of Christian that the Bible talks about. So this is what enables us to be filled with all the fullness of God. Now the one body and the one spirit mean, of course, as verse 4 says, that we have one hope, that is, of our future fulfillment in the, in the eternal kingdom, where we will be filled with all the fullness of God and transformed into the likeness of Christ. That depends upon our allegiance to the one Lord, verse 5, and that allegiance is expressed in the one faith in Jesus as Savior of the Lord, which unites us to him, of which baptism is the outward expression in water baptism, but the baptism into Christ uh, by the Holy Spirit is our initiation into the life of God and our membership of the family of God. So, not surprisingly, there is one God, verse 6, one Father of all of his people. And the alls here are masculine, which means he's not referring to uh, the whole of creation, but to the people who are members of the body of Christ. He is the Father of all, he is over all, he is through all, and he is in us all. Now that is the unity that God has given us. We don't have to create that. That's what it means to be in Christ. And it's obviously uh, true that all those who are part of that unity will want to maintain it. It will be a mark of being a member of the body that we're eager to keep the unity of the spirit 
in the bond of peace. So Paul's saying, look, this is where we start from. This is what's common to every believer in Christ. Whoever we are, whatever our background, wherever we live, we belong to one another because we belong to Jesus. And it means, of course, that there are no special categories, that there are no restricted privileges within this body, that there are no inner rings, that there are no superior groups. All that is anathema to the New Testament doctrine of the church. Our status is that we are all, ever, and only sinners saved by God's grace and therefore equal in God's sight in his mercy and in his saving power. If that's the nature of the unity that he's created then, we've got to be eager to maintain it. And it's striking to me how he helps us with its continuance. If you look at verse 2, he says, Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. NIV puts it very well, be completely humble. The emphasis is on the all. I don't know how you think you rate in the humility stakes. Wasn't it C.S. Lewis who said the problem with humility is that uh, for most of us it's too big a step to admit that we don't have it, so we never start the journey. Um, but however you may think you are humble, this verse is really saying to us, have you got all humility? Are you completely humble? There's still more to go, isn't there? That's how we maintain the unity, by working at these qualities. And they're important qualities, humility, gentleness, patience, and forbearance. Uh, the word that's translated humility was regarded in the first century world as a vice rather than a virtue. Greek and uh, Roman thought said that uh, if you're a humble person, it must mean that you can be walked over like a doormat and uh, therefore it's not something that you should try to cultivate. But the gospel turns that on the head because it is a gospel of a Christ who gave himself up on the cross for us all. And if I'm going to be in the church of Christ, forwarding the unity of Christ, humility is essential. I'm not to be pushy. I'm not to be self-seeking. I'm not to be assertive about me and my uh, uh, abilities or my desires. No, I'm to be characterized by meekness. That's the word gentleness here. And meekness is not weakness. Meekness is determining not to exert force to get what I want, but to act in love towards others. You see how the whole sequence of humility, meekness, patience or long-suffering culminates in forbearing with one another in love. And that, of course, is the direction that Paul's going to take us throughout these chapters. Do you remember last week? The real mark of power is seen in love. The power of Christ is seen in the love of God in the gospel. The power of the church is seen in its love for Christ, for one another, and for a lost world. So the lifestyle that maintains the unity of the Spirit is a lifestyle of service, of love, humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance. And that is the polar opposite to the values of the world's culture, which is precisely why the world is so adrift from God and his purposes, and why the culture is so broken and confused. But the evidence that the gospel is true is seen in the counterculture of the church, the alternative lifestyle of the people of God who are united in Christ and who are eager to do all they can by loving service to maintain that unity. But if there's a foundational reality of what it's to be in Christ, we know that there's a great deal of work to be done in practice. You may know that old rhyme that says, to dwell above with the saints we love, my, that will be glory. To dwell below with the saints we know is quite a different story. And what we've got to do now is to work out the unity of the faith which needs to be attained. So Paul says in verse 7, but grace was given to each one of us. And the but is not a contradiction, it's an explanation. The church is not monochrome. This unity doesn't mean that we're all sort of like a heap of mashed potato without anything unique about us. There's no denial of individuality in the gospel. It's glorious that God has made us so different from one another and he preserves those differences as he shapes us each into a unique reflection of the Lord Jesus. So it's not that God is wanting to make us all exactly like one another. That's not the sort of unity we're thinking about at all. 
And he underlines that by saying grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So what is this master plan then that has to be worked out in attaining from the unity of the spirit which has been given to the unity of the faith that we are to work for? Well, in the second part of the outline there, I've tried to express it in three simple steps and I'll try to explain how they work. It begins, of course, with Christ, the ascended Christ who gifts his church. Here is the measure of Christ's gift, verse 8. It says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now, every Christian, you and me, have received the free gift of grace. That's why we are Christians. We didn't get there by our own works or our own righteousness. God justified us freely by his grace. But it's not just a reference to our salvation. That's where it all begins when we first trust in Jesus. But it's also a reference to the equipping of God's people to live godly lives, to have this worthy walk that verse 1 talked about. And the key in verse 7 is the phrase, according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, if you were with us last Sunday morning, you'll remember we had that according to phrase twice. It's there in 3.16, according to the riches of his glory. And it was there in 3.20, where it says, according to the power at work within us. According to the riches of his glory, we experience the power of the Spirit in our lives. And according to that power at work within us, we bring glory to God and to Christ in the church. And I said last week that according to means not just out of, but commensurate with. If we give according to our wealth, we don't just give a little from it, we give according to it, the proportion of it. And so what is the measure of Christ's gift? Well, Christ's gift is the gift of total authority and power and love at work in him and through the gospel. Everything that we need to live a godly life in this world And according to that measure, he ascended on high, verse 8 says, and he gave gifts to men. Now, if you look at the footnote or the the column in the middle, you'll see that it's a quote from a psalm, Psalm 68. And it's always important to take these Old Testament quotes and to try to understand why they're there. It's not just for convenience. There's some uh, teaching purpose. The psalm celebrated the bringing of the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem in King David's day. And what happens in the psalm is that it traces the whole history of Israel, and it says God brought his people out of Egypt. He brought them to Mount Sinai and gave them the law and the covenant. And he has now brought them through the centuries from Mount Sinai to Mount Zion, which is in Jerusalem. It's now become David's city. And for the first time, the Ark of the Covenant comes to dwell in the city of God in Jerusalem. And David, of course, wants to build a temple for it. But God says, no, you can't do that, David, but your son will, Solomon. So it's a key moment in Israelite history. We've come from Egypt to Sinai. The law of God is now within the Ark of the Covenant, written on the tablets of stone. And that Ark has been taken up to Mount Zion, And uh, the people of God have ascended with the law of God uh, to receive the blessing of God. Now, Paul says that Old Testament sequence foreshadows a greater triumph. Not bringing God's presence to Jerusalem in the form of the Ark of the Covenant, but bringing God's Son to glory after his great work of redemption when he died on the cross and rose again for his people. So the ascent of Jesus is the fulfillment of what the psalm's talking about. That's where you see the victory of God over all his enemies so that he's in a position of full authority to share his grace gifts wherever he will. Now, Paul explains that in verse 9. He says, the reason I'm quoting this is because this Jesus who has ascended to the position of all authority and who can give to his church everything that we need because he's the sovereign king, What does it mean but that he also descended into the lowest parts of the earth? 
That is to say, he came down to earth in his incarnation, but I personally think it's more than that. I think the phrase, the lower parts of the earth, is an Ephesian phrase that talks about those hostile powers we thought about last week. The underworld, if you like, the place where the devil and his demons are active. And it's as though Jesus came down and conquered all the forces of evil. In fact, the letter to, uh, that Peter wrote to the church says that Christ went and preached to the spirits in prison that he declared his victory after his death and resurrection to all those hostile forces, the angels who had rebelled against God and who were being kept in judgment chains until the last day. So the Jesus who came down to die on the cross is the Jesus who triumphed over all the hostile powers and who, because death could not hold him, he conquered death, for he was sinless, was raised by the mighty power of God and ascended into the heavens where now he sits at God's right hand, as we've been reminded often in this letter, so that he may fill all things with himself. Now, it's from that position of supreme authority that he calls the church to receive the gifts of his grace so that we might live out in the world his glorious victory over all those hostile powers. And that's seen in the gifts of verse 11. He gave the apostles and the prophets. We saw last week that they are the foundation gifts of the church. They were the channels of revelation. It's built upon the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. And then we have the continuing gifts, the evangelists and the pastor teachers. They're hyphenated together. It's one gift, pastor, teacher, and evangelist. Obviously, the evangelists are the gospel pro proclaimers who plant churches. The pastor teachers are those who instruct in the word of God and nurture churches and grow them. And to extend all ministry is doing both. But there are specific gifts here of evangelist and pastor teacher. And these are grace gifts to the church. They're word gifts. They're proclaiming gifts. And the ascended Christ gives these gifts, Paul says, to able men within his church, and they are, in a sense, his gifting to the church. Now, that doesn't make them superior. It simply means they have a role to fulfill, which Christ has decreed. That's stage one of his plan. The ascended Christ gives gifts to his church. But why? Well, so that the church may develop in maturity. Look at verse 12. He gave these gifts to equip the saints for the work of ministry. The saints is the word that covers all Christian people, everyone who believes, and therefore all of us are in the work of ministry. And the word gifts, particularly the pastor teacher, is to equip the saints so that together we build up the body, we do the work of ministry. The verb equip there is used in the uh, New Testament to mean mending nets. When the disciples are called from the Sea of Galilee, you know, the fishermen disciples, they were mending their nets. They were equipping their nets, same verb in the Septuagint. And so what we have here is a picture of the pastor-teacher role being given as the word is taught to repair the damage in our lives, to build us up and equip us to do the work that God has for each of us to do. And in this case, you see, the specialist ministries are there to make us all individually and together adequate for the task, which is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Here's the task for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith. So that's what it's about, you see. That's what God is wanting in his church. Building up the body of Christ, that means numbers, yes, but not just numbers. It means strength and quality and Christ-likeness so that we're more and more like the head. And given more detail in verse 13, we see where that unity of the faith will lead us. It's a very rich verse, verse 13. What does it mean to attain to the unity of the faith? It means to know the Son of God better, not just to know about him, but to know him more fully in, our, in relational terms. Yes, we do need to know about him theologically, but we have a relationship with him to deepen, a love relationship to grow, to know him more fully. And that then means that we will be reaching mature manhood, maturity as grown-up Christians, because thirdly, we will be entering into the measure of the stature of the fullness 
of Christ. Now, if you put all those three things together, you see, he's saying we can experience all that the Lord Jesus wants to give us and live a worthy life filled with all the fullness of God, the stature of the fullness of Christ. And you remember last week we thought, thought about that, didn't we, in 3.19, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, the point is this. We have to work together at helping one another in this. We're all involved in this work together. So when we meet one another after church, we want to encourage one another to grow up into Jesus. We want to stimulate one another's faith. We want to increase our sense of dependence on him and of his grace in our lives. So as we talk to one another about our needs, about our situations, about what we're meeting this week and some things we know and some things that have happened this last week that we didn't expect, as we share all the fellowship news, it's not just for information. It's so that we might pray for one another, encourage one another, speak a word of God's grace to one another, build one another up in Christ. That's why in our small groups, it's so important that we don't just in our Bible study groups do the exegesis of the passage, but we do the application of the passage. And we spend time on the application of the passage. And then we spend time on praying in the passage. Because that's the way that we help one another to grow. It's as we, uh, as we enable one another to see what the implications are and as we support one another in working it out in home and family and workplace and social context. In this way, we mature together as Christians. We grow up as an effective church. And an effective church that's growing like that will be, verse 14, a stable church that's not tossed to and fro by all the winds that blow, not blown off course by all the latest fads and fancies that occupy the Christian world. That reference there in verse 14 is, is quite uh, significant, isn't it? It talks about human cunning, and craftiness and deceit. And there was plenty of false teaching around today like that, as there was in Ephesus in the first century. Deceptive trickery that blows the unstable Christian off the rails and, uh, and causes them to crash. Now, we need one another to keep us strong. The word gifts are given to prevent the church from being trapped and derailed by false claims and false priorities and false offers. Because grown-up Christians are not easily distracted by the brightest and noisiest and most exciting things that seem to be around in the marketplace. Rather, we're helping one another to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then the last point is this, that as the church develops this maturity, the world sees God's love in action. Verse 15. Rather, not being blown around by all the winds, but rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped, you matter, I matter, we've all got our part to play, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so that it builds itself up in love. Is that a great vision? That the love of Christians, caring for one another, building one another up, praying for one another in the workplace, in all the opportunities we have to be Christian in the world, as we support one another in these ways, as every part, every joint with which it is equipped enables the body to function, then the body will grow, grow in Christ-likeness, grow in effectiveness, and build itself up in love because the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Spirit is active in all of us, enabling us to love one another and to build one another in Jesus. And I love that beginning of verse 15. It's translated speaking the truth in love, but as you probably know, the truth is the verb there. The verse actually says, rather, truthing in love. That is the mark of the United Church, living and speaking whatever is true and right in love, deep-hearted and practical concern for the benefit of others, a self-sacrificing love like the love that took Jesus to the cross. And brothers and sisters, as we grow more like Jesus in that way, so we grow up into Jesus 
in every area of our lives. And so we become more integrated, wholehearted, committed people. And, and this growth, you see, verse 16 says, comes from Christ. It's from him that the whole body, joined and held together, grows so that it builds itself up in love. It's his energy that does it. It's his life within us that produces real Christian discipleship. He's the one who holds us all together. And it's as the parts of the body are knit together and function with one another and towards one another, each part working properly, that the body grows and keeps growing in strength and in love. So as Peter O'Brien says in his commentary, there cannot be a true church without love between the members. There cannot be a true church without love between the members. So the grace and power of the aris risen, ascended Lord are given to enable us to be the outcrop of his eternal kingdom here in time. This is a life that is worthy of our calling to which Paul urges us. And I want to encourage us to go away this morning saying, well then what can I contribute? Those of us who are in leadership in church, this is a word to us to help everybody within the sphere where we have responsibilities for leading, to help all the members of our groups to discover and utilize and mobilize the varied gifts of grace that each one has. Everybody's got something to contribute. You are a gifted Christian. And it's not that one size fits all. Far from it. There's a huge diversity. But we need to help one another to see what our gifting is and to use it to build up the body of Christ. And for those of us who are members of that body, and this is all of us, we need to be willing to contribute in all the ways we can to work out with our leaders how our gifts can be used, what availability we have, what ways of developing them we have, to consider our gifting and to ask ourselves, given my stage in life, given the um, many responsibilities I may have, what is it I can do for Jesus? See, so often we spend our time wringing our hands about what we don't have time to do and what we would love to do but can't. What is it you can do for him this week? What way is it that you can contribute to the body of Christ because that is the great vision that he has for us and we're all in the ministry in order to achieve the purposes that he has for his body, the church. Let's pray together. Help us Lord we ask by your grace not only to understand these things but to be empowered by your spirit to put them into practice. So help us even this morning as we meet after the service and we have coffee and share together to be building one another up and guide us all to know what you want me to do, Lord, to contribute to the body here and to contribute to that church universal into which you've brought each one of us through the wonderful work of the Lord Jesus. We ask it for his name and for his glory. Amen.